Welcome to Willow Oak Asset Management's Value Hour. I'm Stephen Keel, and joining us for this special Berkshire Hathaway edition is Keith Smith from Bonhoeffer Fund. Keith, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Great. Well, it's good to have you here. And, uh, you know, I think the best way to start out is love to hear a couple of your takeaways from the meeting. Okay. I mean, I think, I think it was a, a different type of a meeting than typically we see. Typically, the meetings we see are sort of a combination of, of um, Warren reflecting on his various businesses, congratulating all of his, his great leaders he has there, and then making a, a small, a small but, but a mention of some historical slash top level theme that he typically has. And this year's bet was, was, was in contrast to that and the fact that he didn't have all the managers, he didn't have this huge big party basically celebrating capitalism in Berkshire Hathaway this year. And so I think the tone was a little bit different. Um, one way to think about it is that if you have if you have a huge birthday party, I'll plan everyone's there. All of a sudden you're in a place where you have a birthday party and no, no one's there anymore. So I think from a home perspective, it's a little bit different. And I think Warren has a tendency to feed off the crowd and that kind of stuff. He really likes doing that. And without the crowd there, I think there was a little bit of lack of that sort of feedback going on, even though throughout the conversation, you could see him getting, uh, getting more and more into it. So, I mean, I think the first thing is basically just the tone. The tone's a little bit different just because of the situation being different. Um, the other thing I think that takeaway I took about was his, his, his reflections on history. Last year, he started out with this tailwinds of America, America having a huge tailwind, and he started continued on with that. I think that was going to be a theme anyways, because he, he, he wrote his report before actually this COVID stuff happened. So in essence, I think that was a continuing theme that sort of happened throughout the throughout the thing, and you can see that. We'll get into some details there. He had some really good points, I think, in terms of the tailwinds that we do have, continue to have even through this, and just this whole thing of, you know, don't sell America short. And I think it's, it can even be probably abbreviated more than that. It's, you know, America is probably the shining example of this, but there's other countries and other cultures that have been able to adapt this type of a situation and really make it more of a, it's a capitalistic type of way of doing things. Yeah, um, absolutely. And the last thing I think he tried to reflect on a little bit was sort of the psychology. I mean, because what you what you really see in terms of um, in terms of markets, it's a combination of facts and the markets incorporating those facts into security prices. But psychology has a huge impact on it. And I think that's why he sort of delved into the issues of the depression, what happened there. Um, there's also some other interesting things that, that I've been able to take a look at subsequently in terms of corroborating what he's talking about there. But I think a lot of it is just the psychology. Because when you think about COVID and its impact on security markets, in terms of absolute you know, deaths and that types of things, I think it's not, it's, not, it's not that big compared to other things. I think he sort of puts that into context when he talks about 6% of people dying in the Civil War, you know, and, the, and, and actually the the Spanish flu, about a half a percent of the people in the United States died. Here we're talking about two tenths, 0.02 percent of people potentially passing away in it with this. So from a from a pure rational perspective, it isn't much, but it's the psychology of the thing. And basically the psychology is what really makes a big difference in markets. And he also brings up the thing about depre the depression and how it, how it basically you know, scarred a whole generation. He mentioned that the, the, the S&P didn't get back to 1929 until like the early 50s. Yeah. And a lot of that had to do with psychology. It didn't really necessarily have to do with the economics. The economy was higher than it was in 1929, but people's psychology was just so much in the doldrums and had so low expectations that basically it didn't really recover till then. So I think those are three of the things that, that I took away in terms of themes that he sort of really delved into, and I think are important for investors to think about. I think his focus also was different. I think a lot of people appreciated this, that his focus was much more on what should you think about as an investor, which yeah. I think is when you look at the, the percentage of the content that was focused in that is much higher than typically he would talk about his managers and his companies and how great they're doing and all that kind of stuff, which is, which is great and something that needs to be done, but there wasn't really room for that this year, or maybe there was, but it just wasn't mentioned in terms of his particular um, his particular thing. The other thing you, I think you need to take, keep in mind is his age. I mean, there were times when these bad things happened, he was a lot younger. He's 90 now. He doesn't know how many more years he's going to be around being 90. And this may be the end or toward the tail end of his career. And, and that's, well, that's why I think his, 
his thesis on the history of American Tailwind was important for him to get out. I think yeah. that was a theme that he really felt was important and didn't necessarily want to leave this earth before he got that that idea out to everybody. And I think that's part of the yeah. things I think he's 90 years old now and Charlie's 96. And, and that's why I think Greg Abel was very important to be there versus Charlie and the fact that we, we got continuity. You know, I, I'm in my sort of toward my the tail end of my career. I'm going to tell you what's most important for everybody to pay attention to, I think is sort of what is focused on. And that's why I think when he talks about for the average person, he continues throughout the past few years, he's talked about index funds and being able to take care of this, being able to take advantage of this tailwind by just index funds. And I think if you look at his, his statements in the past few years, they've just focused on, okay, if I'm a, if I'm a grandfather, when am I gonna tell my grandkids what's the best thing to, what's the best way to invest? And that's sort of been his sort of yeah hot, bad advice over the past four or five years and probably will be continually until until he's no longer he's no longer here. So yeah, and going back to you know with Greg Abel there, I think that's a great point um, to hear. You you have an opportunity now uh, to to hear from Greg, and and he, obviously he has more insight into the operational businesses of Berkshire than anyone else there. And so this was a nice opportunity to see him and hear from him and see his demeanor and see how he interacts with Warren. Uh, what was your kind of takeaway from some of, of Greg's answers and his participation? You know, I, I think he's doing a great job, and really, I think it really goes towards more of what's Berkshire going to be in the future. The, yeah. I think Berkshire yeah. in the future is probably going to be much more of an operational business than 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 let's say. I mean, the stocks are still going to be there and important, but I think the way that Buffett invests with real long time frames, you don't need to really worry about a whole lot of that. The the, the key aspect is is operations, and I think yeah. from what I've heard that things have changed in the fact that. Whereas previously things were run in silos, now there's a lot more cross sharing. It's good to, to know that the guy that's the head of going to be the next head of the company is going to be an operations guy and not an investments guy. I think that puts a lot of confidence in terms of the company is going to be run as a as, as a group of of industrial businesses versus a, an investment company. And I think that's yeah. the, that's the primary the primary message by putting Greg Abel up there as opposed to having you know, either Ted or Todd, or maybe or maybe Agent Insurance is basically, in my mind, saying, okay, that the future of Berkshire is in these industrial slash service businesses that Berkshire has, and that's yeah. going to be the, the main the main focus of the of the business. It's the I mean, it's interesting too when you can look at the asset allocation of the way the business is focused. I've sort of taken a look at okay, what if I take a look at his, his investments plus I add these private businesses. And he's and if you've noticed in the past few years in his annual report, he's sort of divided it out that way. The way he's discussed each one of the businesses has been to say, okay, you know, my two big businesses, which are probably about you know 150, 200 billion plus, are the railroad and the regulated utility. Yeah. Then he brings in the next five businesses, which probably average about a billion a piece, and then he next down the next five businesses, which average about 0.5 billion a piece. Yeah. And you can compare to the size of the other businesses he has and get an idea of what's his overall sort of asset allocation. I mean, the one thing that's interesting is that he continues to hold the banks as, as a core position versus right. like, if you, look, if you look at his overall portfolio over time, what's happened is he's had infrastructure, the two big infrastructure investments, he's had banks and he's had consumer products, which I think people have always known that's sort of been his, his sort of bailiwick. But what's happened is, is that, is that, these other areas he's sort of gone off into, like airlines, oil and gas, in my mind, those are more small excursions because you look at the si relative sizes of these investments and they're relatively small versus they don't have the of what ability, right, is those other businesses as well. Uh, you know, his, his, his um, kind of wheelhouse has always been that predictability, those businesses where you yeah. can make projections out. And those are the major businesses that you mentioned. And right, when he deviates from that, in, in many cases, he's run into trouble. Well, yeah, and it's interesting. One of the one of the spaces I've known that he's gone away from recently has been media. I mean, that was one yeah. question I, 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 I sent into there, but wasn't didn't, as it didn't meet at the queue was, historically, we go back in the 80s, 90s, and even O's media was a very large portion of his yeah. portfolio, but now yeah, it's so practically not. Uh, there isn't much there. He's had AT&T, DirecTV, and small positions, but in my mind, 
I don't know if he's really thinking that the media has changed to the point that it's not as predictable as it used to be, and therefore it doesn't really belong in in the type of a, in a Berkshire kind of portfolio. But if you're, I think the way he's thinking about this portfolio is he knows he's not going to be here. And what kind of businesses is he want to want to invest in that if he's not here to see what's going on, he knows they're still going to do well. And, and right. those, I think the business, the business segments he's chosen are basically the ones where that's really the case and I think will be the case going forward and it's probably a good place for people that are looking for long-term investments to spend a good amount of time on because at least at this point like you said they're steady businesses they haven't been disrupted by technology as much as other sectors like media and therefore their businesses are much more predictable and you can get an idea of sort of what's going on with them because even through this COVID those types of businesses continue to do well you're still going to there's a railroad they're still going to run utilities are still going to be on the food, the consumer products are still going to be consumed. Those things aren't going to go away. Yeah, even if there and, is a decline, you know, but they will exist. Because, I mean, we're in a situation here as, as investors looking at things to say, will this company survive, you know, as we're looking at investments first? And then if, if it checks that box, then you can look at to see if it's undervalued. And they, certainly the, you know, the, the, even the regulated utility is down 4%, um, but, you know, it'll be there. Um, it'll it'll be there after the fact. Certainly, BNSF will be there. Certainly, the consumer staples maybe at a lower volume, but uh, but it checks the first box. Uh, you know, going back to your your point about the psychology and maybe maybe more from a market perspective or macro perspective. Uh, you know, what what do you what do you think? What's your view, kind of relative to um, some of Buffett's comments and focus on uh, you know kind of you know long term nature that we all try to uh, ascribe to. Yeah, I think he gave a great analogy with that. He basically talked about a railroad. Of course, he owned the railroad, but, but the analogy was really good. He basically said, what happened in 2008, 2009 is the railroad ran off the track. Okay, so basically the track being, I think, the the actual financial system, the, the way that money gets out to people. So the train ran off the track. But when the train ran off the track, people were very fast and trying to figure out how to get the train back on the track. The difference between then and the Great Depression is the train fell off the track, but no one wanted to fix the track. So it sort of yeah. stayed. The, the lessons from the 2008, 2009 and the Depression is the longer you let the train get off the track, the, the harder and the longer it's going to take to get the train back on the track. What he said, what he said it's happening now is the, the train is in a sidecar, which is sort of like a sidetrack off a train, and we're just waiting it out. And then once it turns on, but the problem is, and I think he's, he had a really good perception. Part of the, the reason why it's so uncertain is our financial system's not built for that to happen. I mean, just think about, for example, restaurants. Okay, restaurants all of a sudden they, they don't have any revenue. Okay, clearly there's going to be a first order effect on restaurants. Yeah. Everybody knows the government can can easily try to fix that by providing money and support for those restaurants. But the problem is, is it's not only the restaurants. There's a second and third order effect there. The restaurant can't pay their rent. The people that employ the restaurant can't pay the rent. So all of a sudden, it's no, it's all, it's the commercial real estate prob, issuer's problem. It's the residential real estate issuer's problem. Yeah. And the system, the way that we have set up now, the finance system, is not set up to deal with these shocks. It's not set up to deal with, okay, if everything needs to close down for a month, in theory, what you'd want to do is everybody to say, okay, we're going to put a, a, a forbearance on all, all payments for a month or two, and then we're all going to start back up again. Because in essence, if you look at it from a DCF perspective, the loss of two or three months of cash flow is minuscule in terms of the big picture. But the system's not set up that way. The system's set up so that if someone misses a payment, all of a sudden, and the issue here is I think that the reason it's set up that way is because if someone of their own volition decides to go out and lever themselves up and get into problems, there's a huge incentive for them not to do that. But the system is not set up to deal with a situation like this, where you got a situation where you have to close down the whole country. That's yeah. not really the, the people's, the people that 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 basically are in the restaurant that the whole country has to be shut down. But because of that, the, the, and and I think the, where his uncertainty really is is not only that not that first order effect. I think we've got that down. The question is the second and third order effect when you get to the banks, when you get to the forbearance, the, because then all of a sudden all these banks and other institutions are levered. And the reason they're levered is because, in essence, it's usually a pretty consistent return. But but once the when, when stuff starts going down, and, and, and the real question now, the real uncertainty is, I mean, I 
looked at it and have some investments in some of these real estate investment trusts. And it's the same issue there. And the fact that, that, okay, well, you can try and do things. And in most of that space, what I've seen is people have deferred rent over a certain period of time and it can make it whole. And it's, it's, it's definitely a doable problem, but the yeah. system, the, the, the system is not set up to differentiate. Okay. Someone makes a non-payment because they over levered themselves or someone's made a non-payment because of COVID. The system's not set up to deal with two different reasons. One probably legitimate, the other one not. And so right. I think there needs to be, hopefully there'll be some adjustment in the system, which, you know, Buffett says, don't bet against America. I think part of the betting, betting for America is something. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, we'll figure out ways to adapt to it, right? But it takes time and uh, there'll be a transition period. And that's, that's kind of some of the uncertainty over the next few years. You know, how does the system change? We saw changes after 08, 09 um, that had had kind of ramifications uh, mm -hmm. future on and we'll have those same uh, we'll have we'll have some sort of um, second third fourth order effects and they could be huge you know and talking about kind of the fed if we want to maybe maybe take a look I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective a little bit on some of the fed policies and you know the fact our, our risk-free rates you know 60 basis points at this point um, and you know how does that affect and change how does some of the fed actions as well how, how does that change buffett's behavior uh, I think I, th I think it's good, and I think Buffett realizes that it's good. I think where the opportunities are for Buffett and these distressed guys is in, is in the long term restructuring of some of these businesses, which I think is is completely fair. I mean, it's not in providing rescue financing to rescue these businesses today. The Fed has taken that opportunity away, but I think in reality, the the, the reason why those types of things typically happen is because of some system that shouldn't have been that way to begin with. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, so and I, a lot of that has been ameliorated and the Fed I think has done a great job in terms of basically being able to be hugely reactive to this, even the administration and providing the PPP and for all the issues that those programs have, it's, it, it's a great, it, it's, it's huge to see the government's willing to do that right out of the box, bipartisan, there was no, there was no issues about. I mean, there were a few things, but for the most part, there was not very much questioning about what yeah. how, how it would work. And so, well, so I mean, that rescue I, financing is gone for Buff for Berkshire. It, I mean, it's a great point. Uh, it's it crowds out the potential for rescue financing to any large degree. Uh, then, then why not why not increase the buybacks, right? So, what what's the situation with the Berkshire buybacks now? Why don't you think it was greater? Well, I, I, th I think the reason is because he really sees, he really thinks in the second and third order impacts. And he sees the potential of those being greater and there's huge, a lot more uncertainty than what he thought there was before. Yeah. Um, in essence, the second and third order impacts. And if we get through this and, and there's unique ways to fix these things and that kind of stuff, I think we'll probably feel comfortable going back to buybacks. But given where we are now, where it's a, a lot of unknown, I think what you got here is, a lot of uncertainty. And when you've got a lot of uncertainty, it doesn't necessarily mean things are gonna be bad, it just means that there's really no clear path. The predictability goes away that he likes, right? Yeah, so it, make, it, it makes it, it's an interesting time to invest because with uncertainty, there's a lot of opportunity, but there also is, a, you know, if you, can get, if you have some insights that other people really don't have, it turns out to be the way that you think it's gonna happen. And yeah. for him, he just really sees it as just being, being an insurance guy is probably thinking in probabilities all the time. And, and this is probably really expanded out because it's not, that's not just the pandemic. The pandemic's a little thing, but this, the way the system has been built up and the and, and the ability of the system to deal with this. I mean, I mean, we'll see. I mean, and that's why I think he brought up the illustration again of the of how long it took the market to 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 recover from the depression and how that's keyed, I think, the point he was trying to get across in that. And that psychology is going to have a huge impact if we can get this thing right. It's not going to be 25 years before the before the S and P's back up to where it is before. But if we get it yeah. wrong, it will be. I mean, one of the big differences I think they also mentioned, which I think is very important, is the FDIC. And reading back in the depression time frame, you had thousands, tens, yeah, thousands of banks going disappearing. So I mean, think about this: you you save your entire life, you put all your money in the bank. And then one day the bank says it's closed. Yeah. And you have you have no income because you probably lost your job and you have no money. 
and he talked about how his dad basically worked for a bank and basically saved in the bank and how basically what happened there was he found out he lost his job and he lost his money the same day and he his dad had to work for his grandfather in the grocery store i mean yeah that's probably yeah. not probably not untypical of what happened back then when the banking system was not as robust as it is today and i think a lot of this is just refining and improving the banking system and he probably brings those up to it's interesting that he does have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of banks as investments today and, and if the banks can get this stuff figured out it, they become real interesting opportunities i think going well, they've forward. Come in, right you know coming into this crisis they the banks are in better shape than they've ever been they're overcapitalized and you know there was government policies related to that in, in addition to the protections that you mentioned uh but then you know the banks were at this point of the cycle um, and these are ram these are pos positive ramifications, quite frankly, from 08, 09, that that banks are um, are overcapitalized in the way that they they were. So you know, on that on that end, let's um, let's go ahead and wrap it up here. Let's hope the that the the party shows up again next year. Uh, we'll we'll be back in person. Uh, kind of miss seeing everyone in person. Missed all the hoopla and parties and uh, yeah. you know auxiliary events to Berkshire, catching up with old friends that we do once a year there. So. That's been sad. We're trying to do it virtually, of course, and um, but uh, you know it's good good to be able to uh, to do it in person, and we hope to do that again next year. So thanks, Keith, for joining us. Uh, we look forward to doing it again, um, and uh, it's always great to hear your thoughts. All right, thanks, Keith.